looking at Act 19 again today. Um, but before I start, I'd just like to uh, just like, yeah, Lord, thank you, Lord, that, uh, that we can meet together and we can worship you, Lord. You are such a good, good father. Um, and thank you, Lord, that you love us so much. I pray as we, we look at Acts 19 again today, Lord, that you'll just you'll speak to each one of us, Lord. And I pray for myself, Lord, I pray that you would help me to speak clearly um, and to bring what you want people to hear. Amen. Amen. So it's uh, Acts 19 verses 8 to 20 today. Um, it's not very long, so I'll just read through that. Uh, now, uh, so you get a sense of, uh, of what we're looking at today, um, and then we'll get stuck in. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of, the, of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honour. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who practised sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Well, that's certainly an interesting passage. People yeah. trying to perform exorcisms, uh, handkerchiefs healing people. Uh, what I want to try and do this morning is unpack these extraordinary events um, and dig down into the heart of them. Before we get stuck in, just a little bit of background for you. We learned last week that Paul has arrived in Ephesus um, uh, this week, we just read that he stays there for two years, uh, teaching about God's kingdom. And it says that over those two years, that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. That's quite some evangelism. I mean, Paul is not holding back. You'd be forgiven for thinking that this passage is about how amazing Paul has become. After all, we just read that handkerchiefs and aprons that he touched healed people and the evil spirits knew his name. However, this isn't really a passage about Paul. The key verse is at verse 17. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honour. So first of all, this morning, let's look at the seven sons of Sceva. Acts says that they were Jews uh, who were going around trying to drive out evil spirits and that they tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed, over those who were who needed healing, over those they were, they were praying for. Um, but it, at one point it doesn't go well for them at all, does it? One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? And the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. Gave them such a beating that they run out of the house naked and bleeding. So why did it go wrong for them? We know from verse 12 that uh, 
that Paul had been had been healing people and that casting out evil spirits. So what happens with these men? You see, what's happening in Ephesus is that these men had seen Paul and they'd seen the miracles that he was performing in the name of Jesus. And they think, great, let's have a go. It's almost like they thought that it was some sort of magic formula, that if they said what Paul said, it would work. Maybe like they were uh, repeating a magic spell or something. Yet there's a fundamental difference between Paul casting out uh, demons, you know, casting out evil spirits, uh, healing people in Jesus' name by the power of the spirit and this knockoff attempt by these Jews. When they tell this evil spirit, this demon to leave, they're trying to do it in their own authority. And honestly, it's actually a little bit funny because what they're basically trying to do is name drop. They say in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. It's like um, it's like if you were to say, oh, yes, I know uh, Lewis Hamilton because my uncle's next door neighbor went to school with him. Or perhaps if you said, uh, oh, yes, uh, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, I know them really well because um, because I met them for 30 seconds at a charity event. It's no wonder that this demon turns around and says, Nah, mate. No wonder he not only doesn't obey them, but he gives them a good beating too. Yet the key thing uh, in, in this passage is that the demon admits that he does know Jesus and that he knows of Paul. He's admitting that he's scared of Jesus and that he knows whose authority Paul speaks with. But as soon as these pretenders, these counterfeits speak, he sees them for what they are, frauds and fakes. Before I started plumbing, um, my first job was actually in retail. I worked in a, a really big BHS in South East London. Um, and uh, we had these special pens that you could uh, find out whether or not a banknote was fake or not. Um, and and uh, particularly, we were told to check fifty pound notes. That was that was very strict. That was company policy. We had to check every fifty pound note that we were handed. Um, and the way these pens work is, you just draw a line on the banknote. Now, if it's a real banknote, the pen doesn't react, um, and so nothing happens. It's an invisible line. However, if it was a, a fake banknote, because of how hard it is to replicate banknotes. Um, with the materials that they're made with. If it was a fake banknote, then it would draw a, a brown line or a, dirt, a, a dark line across the note, and then you would know that it was fake. Believe it or not, I was actually handed more than one fake £50 note in a little, uh, a little I think it was a little over a year that I worked in retail. Um, and the thing is, they looked really convincing. They looked like the real deal. They really did. Um, but as soon as that pen went across them, they were instantly exposed as, as being as being fake. Listen to what it says in Matthew 7 verses 15 to 20. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. See, the demon knew that these men were false prophets because it recognized the authority and the power of Christ and that Paul was operating under that authority. As I said, these men seem to think it was some magic formula. That if they could simply imitate Paul and use his words, that uh, they could have the same success. But it was all about them. And on the south surface, it sounds the same. It looks the same. But what they didn't understand is that there's power in the name of Jesus. 
they didn't understand it wasn't Paul performing miracles, but the Holy Spirit through him. This is why it's so important to ensure we are continually reading our Bibles and spending time with God so that we know with complete certainty what God says. We can know whether what we're being told uh, from the front, I say the front, that's a, that's a saying, isn't it? But I, this is effectively from the front of church while we're online, while you're all looking at me on the screen. Um, but also while you're looking at your screens, looking online, or things that we're hearing from, from friends or from people we know, from colleagues, we can know whether it's true or not, by whether it lines up with the scripture. By looking at people's lives, by seeing the fruit that's being produced. Now, this isn't to say that we should be judging others, but that we need to be weighing up words and actions of those around us, of, of the things that we're seeing, especially in this information age, where we're getting so much information via the internet and social media and television. We need to be weighing up everything uh, and weighing it against biblical truths and weighing it against what Jesus teaches us. In effect, the Bible is our counterfeit pen. Like that pen that I used uh, to check the banknotes. That's, that's the Bible for us. Does what we listen to, does what we've heard add up to what Jesus tells us? When we listen and obey God, when we walk under his name, we have the same power that Jesus had, that Paul had. And we can see that power outworking in our lives. In Jesus' name isn't a nice ending to a prayer. It's not something we say just because that's what you say. It's not a magic formula. It has power behind it. Because Jesus went to war for us on the cross and he won. And the demons, they know it. And sickness knows it. And the enemy, the evil one, knows it. And he is scared of the name of Jesus. He is scared of Jesus. And he is scared of those that wield his name, knowing and believing the power that it brings. We need to be like Paul. We need to know our Bibles. We need to be in relationship with God, praying spending time with him, walking with him, being filled with the spirit. If I hadn't been taught how to use that pen, I would never have found those fake 50 pound notes that I was handed. But it wasn't just that I was taught how to use it. I also had to actually keep using the pen. You see, if I had, uh, you know, I couldn't be bothered or if it had been really busy. And so I didn't use the, the pen then I still wouldn't have known that I'd been handed the fake 50 pound notes. And sometimes, rarely, but sometimes a customer would even get very annoyed um, and quite aggy that I was checking their money, almost like it was a personal affront. What if I didn't check the money just because I didn't want to offend anyone or hurt anyone's feeling? We can't just know that Jesus saved us and that's it. We need to be walking in this every day. Romans 12 verse 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. And it's not just about us either. It's not just about um, protecting ourselves from from frauds, from lies, from the schemes of the enemy. It's also about others, too. And about people that haven't yet come to the Lord, people that haven't given their life to Christ. Because we see in Acts 19 that the combination of Paul's teaching and God working powerfully through him transforms the city of Ephesus. Brings people to Christ. Yet we also see that when these frauds, when their lies are exposed and when the name of Jesus was held in high honour, that people repented. They realised what they'd believed before was wrong because it had been exposed as false by the power of Jesus. 
It said, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honour. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practised sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. It's so important that we understand that there is power in the name of Jesus. Now, not just that we know it, but that we live in it. Because we have the power to transform lives. Not because of anything that we are, but because as believers, we have the Holy Spirit in us. We are living by the name of Jesus. And if we're living by the name of Jesus, others will notice. Those around us, friends, family, colleagues, those who don't know Christ. They will see, they will notice something different in us. And if we're letting God's light shine through our lives, we can help to expose any lies, any false power that people are under, frauds, the things that, that people are trusting in. These things can be exposed. These false teachings and these false ideas can be exposed. Just look at what happened in Acts 19. After lies, the frauds were exposed and people repented of their lies in their own life. Of the false teachings and the followings and the ideas that they, they had been following. Because they realised that they'd been trusting in the wrong things. Now that we've looked at those men who didn't understand the name of Jesus. Let's look at a man who did. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him, had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. You see, there's two parts here. Part one, spread the gospel. First, Paul goes to teach in the synagogue. And uh, actually, for Paul, this actually goes relatively well. He manages to, to stay in the synagogue uh, preaching the gospel for about three months. And there's not any riots and nobody's stoned. And, um, but eventually there, there are some that, that do resist. And so he leaves, leaves the synagogue when, uh, when they start to get aggressive. Um, and he finds another place to teach. He doesn't just give up. Uh, instead, he, he finds the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And, and for two years, he's then preaching the gospel. Um, but he's not just preaching, he's teaching. He's, he's telling people, he's explaining to people. Like I said earlier, he's not holding back. But part two is that he's performing miracles. He's moving in power. Not his power, the power of the spirit. It's so important that we don't just see. Sorry, it's so important. We don't just see it here, but all through the New Testament. This this model we see that it's gospel and power. These two go hand in hand, sharing the gospel miracles and there's a really good reason why the apostles and the early church did this because it's what jesus did during jesus life on earth there were two sides to his ministry he taught he preached he proclaimed his message 
just like this is what Paul's then doing later. He's, he's following in Christ's footsteps. But he also performed miracles. Jesus was backing up what he taught with action, with power. Jesus's words were backed by divine supernatural authority. Jesus was able to back up his words with power because he's God. But we have access to that same divine power. And we know that because Jesus tells us in John 14, verses 15 to 17, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. You see. Paul had access to the Holy Spirit, was filled and empowered by the Spirit. He couldn't perform miracles because of anything he was, because he had superpowers or he knew the right magical words. It's because God was working through him, performing miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. These are miracles in which God reveals himself. It's not about glorifying Paul. This is about God revealing himself and being glorified. And it sounds outrageous and, and so out there to hear that even handkerchiefs and aprons that were being touched by Paul were healing people. But that's just how amazing and how awesome God is that that he was working in such power and that, that Paul was 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 performing these miracles. The spirit was working in such power. That, that that was overflowing, that even inanimate objects were then carrying forward the power of God. It's just incredible to, to think about how, just how powerful our God is. Our God is the one who created the universe itself. Everything, nothing's impossible to him. You see, this is about the gospel being backed up by that power that unimaginable power of the creator of the father the son and the spirit and jesus is our perfect example of that he taught he preached but he moved in power as well and all through acts as we've read so far gospel alongside miracles it's backed up by power changing lives forever transforming people it's not because of who we are it's because of what jesus has done and it's not because of what we do it's because of who jesus is each of us this morning that has given our life to jesus have the same holy spirit dwelling in us 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, do you not know that the bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? What Jesus modelled for us, what Paul and the apostles modelled for us, what the early church models for us is sharing the gospel and power. It's sharing the gospel and miracles. We need to proclaim the gospel in the name of Jesus, but we also need to pray for the sick, pray for the poor, pray against the enemy, pray against his lies, pray against his stronghold, the stranglehold that he has on, on our society, that he has on people that we know. And we need to do that. We need to pray for that in the name of Jesus and we need to believe in that power of Jesus we don't want to be like those men that just thought oh if I say the right thing this is going to work out fine because it didn't work out fine and it's not about that at all it's about Jesus we have access to the same Holy Spirit that Paul did so why shouldn't we pray for miracles why shouldn't we believe as a church for them to happen? Why shouldn't we believe for healing? 
why shouldn't we believe for extraordinary things to happen? Remember that counterfeit pen I told you about? Remember I told you that it was on me to keep using it? Well, it's on us to keep using our faith, to keep stretching our faith, our belief in Christ Jesus, to read our Bibles, to study the word of God, to pray and be in fellowship with God and to be in fellowship with each other, to be setting our eyes on him and not the things of this world, to be asking him for more faith, to be trusting God. Yes, to protect ourselves individually, but also as a church, to be looking out for one another, to be strong in our in our knowledge and strong in our relationship with God. There was a, a picture given on on Wednesday in the prayer meeting um, of Roman soldiers and how they put together their shields and it was called a tortoise formation. Um, you might have seen it before and the, and the shields were at the front and at the sides and at the back and on top. And, and that togetherness that brought strength. And even when somebody was injured, even if an arrow did get through, they, they'd pull that man in. And then another man would take his place and put the shield up. That's what we need to be as a church and as Christians. To protect ourselves, to protect each other. Because we are in a battle. There is an enemy. But there's so much more to them that to, to it too. We also need to be equipped to spread the gospel so that we too can combine gospels with miracles. Gospels with praying for healing, praying for the sick and praying for the poor and praying for the needy and believing in the power of Jesus, in the name of Jesus to radically change people's lives. On, on that prayer meeting on, on Wednesday, Christian Manda led us through praying through the armour of God. That was Paul who wrote about the armour of God. Um, and and that, that's from his experience of, of sharing the gospel. That's that's from his, his life that we're reading about in Acts and that you, you can see in so many books in the New Testament. Ephesians 6 verse 10 to 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. The interesting thing about that torster shell formation is that although it's very good defensively, they also used it a lot offensively because it was so hard to stop a line, a, a group of soldiers that were advancing on you when that, it was so impenetrable. So like Paul did, let's put on the armour of God because we still live in a battlefield. Because we need to protect ourselves from the lies of the enemy. But also because there are lives around us that can be transformed by the power of the spirit. We need to proclaim the gospel in the name of Jesus. We need to pray for the sick, pray for the poor, pray against the lies and the strongholds of the enemy in the name of Jesus.